Hi, my name is Glenn Weinreb, and today we're going to explore how to prevent runaway climate change by reflecting sunlight back into outer space. This is a new field and therefore requires research. The key question for scientists is, how might we reflect approximately 1% of sunlight back into outer space at a reasonable cost and without causing harm? We're already reflecting sunlight since it reflects off man-made air pollution. More specifically, it reflects off of sulfur. It's possible this is a key element in solving the climate problem. Let's take a closer look. Sulfur is an element on the periodic table and it is present in large amounts within coal and oil. Therefore, it is typically emitted into the atmosphere when these fuels are burned. Sulfur is harmful to people, plants, and oceans. Consequently, governments often require that some sulfur be filtered out before or after combustion. However, even with some filtration, approximately 70 million tons of sulfur dioxide gas are emitted globally into the atmosphere each year. After sulfur is emitted into the atmosphere, it typically combines with water and oxygen to form H2SO4. This nucleates, which means it converts to tiny physical particles. Water sticks to these particles and causes them to grow into physical water droplets. And droplets containing sulfur typically reflect more sunlight than those without. Therefore, more sulfur causes more sunlight to reflect back into outer space instead of being absorbed by the planet. In effect, sulfur cools the planet. A notable example is the 1991 volcanic eruption of Mount Pinatubo, which released sulfur dioxide gas into the atmosphere. And this caused the average global temperature to decrease approximately 0.4 degrees Celsius for several months. As mentioned previously, sulfur is present in coal and oil and is released during combustion. In theory, we can filter more of it out before combustion, transport the harvested sulfur to an airplane and emit it at a high altitude instead of at ground level. High altitude sulfur stays aloft for one to two years, while ground level sulfur typically stays aloft for only several days. Therefore, changing the emission site reduces the planet's temperature without increasing total sulfur emissions. The latter point is important since sulfur is harmful, as noted previously. Sulfur-based materials are not the only substances with reflective properties. For instance, calcium carbonate, commonly known as chalk, exhibits similar capabilities. Further research is needed to understand the benefits and drawbacks of each candidate material. To justify the expense, we would need to compare the cost of cooling the planet with the cost of not cooling the planet. One study suggests large-scale planet cooling would cost approximately $18 billion a year. For comparison, the total value of New York City property is $1,400 billion. And this is just one coastal city that would be lost to sea level rise. If the U.S. paid half, planet cooling would amount to about $30 per American per year. For details, see Wake Smith's excellent 2024 paper. Increasing the reflectivity of the atmosphere is a new field, and there are many things we don't know. We don't know what to inject, when, where, and how, and we don't have an accurate assessment of costs and adverse side effects. To resolve unknowns, we need R&D. 
This includes developing better instrumentation for measuring atmospheric reflectivity, developing equipment that injects small amounts of material for field experiments, and developing equipment that injects large amounts of material for full-scale operations. Geoengineering involves injecting material into the atmosphere, either intentionally or as a side effect of another activity. An example is the 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide and the 70 million tons of sulfur dioxide that are emitted into the atmosphere each year due to burning fossil fuel. Also, roughly 7 million tons of sulfur dioxide are considered for injection each year into the upper atmosphere to prevent runaway climate change. Let's compare these three geoengineering activities. To make this easier to follow, we will refer to them as Geo1, Geo2, and Geo3. Geo1 and Geo2 are ongoing operations, while Geo3 is under consideration. Geo1 and Geo2 inject material at low altitudes, while GEO-3 targets high altitudes with airplanes. GEO-1 warms the planet, while GEO-2 and GEO-3 cools the planet. GEO-3 involves 6,000 times less material than GEO-1 by weight. However, GEO-3 has a large cooling effect per gram of material, in part due to its long hover time, as noted previously. Each geoengineering activity can be characterized with multiple parameters, and these can be quantified by scientists. They do this with scientific models, laboratory experiments, and field experiments. Lab experiments typically involve measuring properties of gases within chambers inside a laboratory. An example parameter is increased acidity. We know how much acidity is caused by each gram of material, and we know how many grams of material are emitted each year. And from this, we see GO2 contributes 10 times more acidity than GO3, and GO1 contributes roughly 100 times more than GO2. We can also look at size by weight. For instance, GO1 is enormous. To get a sense of this, we can look at what happens when an A 380 airplane flies from New York to Tokyo. This one flight injects roughly 1 million pounds or 500 metric tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. This is about the same weight as 500 small cars. To get a better sense of this, we can view 140 parked cars, which is roughly one third of 500. And this is just from one flight from one airplane. For reference, there are roughly 28,000 commercial airplanes worldwide, and airplanes are responsible for just 3% of total carbon dioxide emissions. In other words, GO1 is massive, and in comparison, GO3 is tiny. However, for the most part, the public does not like GO3 even though it could potentially be helpful. This is likely to change as the risk of runaway climate change becomes more evident. Most climate activists prefer decarbonization. However, as noted in previous videos, the climate problem has progressed beyond the point where decarbonization by itself is sufficient. The first tipping point to activate would probably be North Pole sea ice. After this melts, sunlight would be absorbed by water instead of being reflected by sea ice. To get a sense of what this would do, one can hold their hand up to the sun and feel the warmth. This is the amount of additional heat we would get times the surface area of North Pole sea ice. This is not a small chunk of ice. This has a surface area of 5 million square kilometers, which is half the size of the United States. 
losing this reflector would increase the average global temperature by 0.6 degrees Celsius. And this would trigger other tipping points. Therefore, we would like to prevent the first tipping point from activating. This entails calculating the percentage of sunlight that needs to be reflected and the year that full-scale operations would need to commence. And this entails putting together a reflectivity plan with three primary phases. These are R&D, construction, and full-scale operations. R&D would involve field experiments. Construction would involve building a fleet of airplanes and supporting airport infrastructure. And full-scale operations would involve flying airplanes. Public support for this is currently low, in part due to a lack of understanding of what would happen if sunlight was not reflected. However, this is not necessarily a problem. This is because initial R&D can be funded by forward-leaning foundations and governments, and therefore does not need broad support. However, public support would eventually be needed for activities such as construction and full-scale operations. For details on initial R&D, click on the link in the description below. Okay, that's it for me, and I'll talk to you all real soon.